What's up, crew? Hope you're having a rad day. If you're tuning in for my latest riding adventure, I will be delivering that in a couple of days. If you need something to hold you over, go ahead and check that corner link. This episode is a discussion about a unique way of picking a mountain bike. I'm Alan, and this is the Airhorn Podcast. This is the Airhorn Podcast. Gonna slow down and talk about going fast. It's another mountain biking podcast. And we sometimes answer questions you have. Listen at one and a quarter speed. You can listen in any order you please. It might be the worst, it could be the best. Sometimes it's just me, sometimes there's a guest. It's the Airhorn. I'm Alan, this is the Airhorn Podcast, and in this episode, we discuss a different way of thinking about choosing a mountain bike. This isn't going to be a neatly packaged five-step process, but rather an approach that requires a bit of introspection. In case you're currently checking the runtime of this video, yes, it's more than an hour long. But this is, after all, a podcast format. Again, if you're in this for a writing video, check that corner link. For those of you who are stoked to settle in for a deep dive into this subject, hang out. I'm honored in this podcast to have Tawny Walling, owner and founder of The Path Bike Shop and one of the hosts of The Path Podcast. He's also the guy that was in my recent Santa Cruz Bullet video. He was the guy who lent me the Santa Cruz Bullet. You'll get to know Tawny a bit more in the podcast, but I wanted to point out two traits that I really admire about him. One, he is practiced at getting to the heart of any subject really quickly. Two, he is patient with goons like myself who take a little bit longer to get there. Tani and I mostly discuss how to choose your quote-unquote first mountain bike. You'll see why I put quotes around that in just a bit. We talk new bikes, used bikes, Tawny gives us a couple of tips on how to find a bike during the pandemic, and our conversation branches off here and there on certain tangents. We discuss braking technique, coaching, and we cover a bunch of your questions. All right, with that being said, grab a beverage or put on that cruise control, settle in, and enjoy the conversation. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this podcast. This is, I guess, technically an air horn podcast. Um, we don't do these as often as we used to, but I recently went on a ride with Tawny Walling, who is the owner and founder, is that correct, of the Path Bike Shop? Yep, um, owner and founder. Since 1990... 1998. 1998, so he's been at it for a while. Uh, we recently went on a ride, and um, you know, uh, I'd been getting questions about... Uh, not from Tawny, but from people in general about like, how do you get into mountain biking? What's, how do you choose a bike? Um, and we, you know, kind of chatted about it a little bit uh, after the ride and decided um, at some point to get on the horn together and and talk about this stuff. Um, but something I like to do uh, just to kind of let people get to know who we're talking to um, without me having to do an introduction is I like to do this little thing called, wait, let me find my banners, called milestones. And this is pick three milestones from your mountain bike or cycling or two wheeled life um, from the past. And like, what are three milestones for you? Mm, good one. I would say, uh, uh, Oh, that's difficult. Um, an early one was riding my Schwinn Stingray and kind of game trails and hiking trails in in the rural outskirt, outskirts of Gainesville, Florida, when I was like five or six. Mm, okay. And then another one was probably doing some of the Pushikona event. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to pick just one, but the Pushikona events that Maxwell did. Da, did. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, I think opening the shop would have to be one. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Wow, that was actually you came out with those pretty great, pretty dang quick. I think I um, could go on, but I think it's good you asked for just three. <laughs> well, okay. Well, that's actually great because what do you, what would you want to have your next milestone be? Oh, that's a good question. 
Wow. You know, as I'm going to answer that from the moment we're sitting right now and just what comes to mind. And I, I might not even want to be held to this in the future, but I'd like to get, um, I'd like to put together a series where uh, of uh, a length of time where I put enough time in on the saddle to get a good amount of fitness back together. That's a like point. It. Yeah. Cause it sounds like there is a tension between running a bike shop and running, riding a bike. There can Maybe. be, um, mm -hmm. there can be, I think, um, some people have struggled with that more than, than I have because, I, I have been lucky in kind of my natural tendency to be able to leave work at work and go ride a bike for the most part. And if work does creep into the bike riding, a lot of times it's really in ways that end up kind of making me a person I like better, you know, like I help someone on the trail or something. It's not like a bad thing, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, we should actually do something really quick. Uh, so, it, it, crew, you know, you, hopefully, you know, you should know that I'm an ambassador for the path bike shop. So and Tawny's the owner of the path bike shop. So I'd really like to give you the opportunity to, I don't know, maybe just give us like, if you could come up with an elevator pitch for the path, like how mm. would you define it? Good one. Yeah. So we're a core mountain bike shop. And we want to meet our community where they're at and build our business by building the community and being part of something fun. And um, we're a humanist, which means that we believe it, what, what, that I hold a personal opinion that the best way to motivate people and to get results is to create an atmosphere where people feel challenged in a, in a way where they're safe to fail and rewarded and part of a community and have the ability to, in other words, their needs are met as people, right? They're respected. They're treated as people, not just as, so that goes to, you know, customers, riders. We think, I try to think of everyone as a rider more than even a customer. It's kind of corny, mm. <laughs> but it, it's the truth. Um, yeah. Authenticity, grit. We come from a really humble place and we try not to ever forget that. That's cool, man. Um, I can, you know, speaking from my end of, of being a customer or, you know, a rider at the path shop, um, I, th so I'm going to go back a little bit. So I come out of skateboarding, you know, and you would walk most skate shops you would walk into, you always felt like, you know, you were measured on some level of coolness as you walked in. And if you didn't hit that level, you just weren't treated very well. Um, and I remember there was a skate shop in Redlands that was called Band. And the way they treated you in there was exactly like that. Like you were just, you were another human. And whether you had never been on a board or if you were a pro skater, they treated you the same. Um, and when I walked into the path, it felt very much like that. And like hanging out there, I've watched so many people come in. Somebody would come in with a, you know, $10,000 bike and they were treated with a certain level of quality. And somebody would come in with a Walmart bike that wanted a new tube and they would get treated with the same level of quality. Um, and I, that was just really cool to see. Yeah. Thanks for noticing. Yeah. And that, that, that is, that is the spirit of the path for sure. Yeah. And it's interesting too, that we share that skateboard background. Mm -hmm. You know, when I opened the path, it's, it's less true now, but in 1998, most bike shops were really treating it as like an exercise equipment and not a lifestyle. And if it was a lifestyle, it was all about race. So the path was one was early on in this kind of trail bike lifestyle, ex the expressive side of mountain biking and not just like we like going fast, but we also like the expressive creative side. That's rad. God, I wish I had known about you guys uh, in back then. <laughs> Cause when I, when I first got back into mountain biking, like the, in those, in those years, it, that's where everything felt like, you know, yeah, uh, and I and I just really couldn't connect to it, and I kind of went back to my skateboarding roots. But yeah, well, and I was that kid in the skate shop and in the surf shop, and a lot of times I was almost not consequential enough even to be judged 
like I was just like it like a fly on the wall um you know when you're especially when you're a little a smaller kid you know and I was I was really really short so when I was say 14 15 16 I might have I was the when I was 14 I have a 12 year old son my 12 year old son is the same height I was I was when I was 14 I was always wow, like the okay. shortest kid in school so like I'd show up at the skate shop and like I was almost invisible um <laughs> not to mention I didn't have any money to spend Right. And I was yeah. too shy to talk to anyone, but I would sit there and I would just soak up the conversation. <laughs> and ultimately some of the skate shops and surf shops that I hung out with at were actually pretty warm, welcoming places and not mm. just kind of ego fests. And so that gave me definitely that skate surf action sports um, side of mountain biking was something that I saw a lot. I felt strongly that there was something there. And there wasn't a scene around it or a shop or shops around it at the time. Mm, yeah. Well, that, that definitely seems to come through at the, at the path. Thanks. Um, We're cool, stoked to cool. have you as an ambassador, Alan, and it was super fun riding with you the other day. It's good to see you too. Heck yeah, man. Yeah. It's good to see you. How, yeah. How, how are you, how are you doing today? Doing great. I didn't, um, didn't even ask like really. <laughs> went into the shop for a few hours, did some, did some stuff and then took the kids to soccer. My older son is an assistant coach on my younger daughter's soccer kind of club thing. It's a super fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Right on. Um, yeah. So let's, let's jump into this. Okay. So, um, you know, the selling point of our conversation is really aimed at, or, or is really about how to choose a mountain bike. And we really are hoping to focus this on the beginner mountain biker or somebody who's been in it just a little bit, you know, um, I kind of think of the, the kind of spiel that I've given is like your first mountain bike. Isn't really your first mountain bike. Uh, it's like your appetizer and, uh, your second mountain bike is really your first mountain bike because sometimes it takes okay. that first one to figure out where you're at. I'm glad you said that. Cause I was just thinking to myself, is this about the first bike or is this about the first nice bike? <laughs> right yeah yeah but let's let's um so okay that's the thing i think like that's generally the story you know like somebody gets into mountain biking and they just have no idea what to get and they end up getting something that's maybe not the greatest and then they realize what they need so i'm hoping that this conversation can kind of help some of those people out who maybe um are still thinking about getting a bike um or are also we can kind of move into that second bike right but, or the um, higher budget part of it might be the first nice bike for the other part of the audience right yeah like yeah you actually talk to that i, I feel like you've got a, a couple of points coming coming at me right now yeah i mean if we're talking hardtail due to budgetary reasons then that very likely might not be your first nice bike. Like it's nice. Like make no mistake, a six hundred and fifty dollar bike or whatever price bike you buy, it's nice. It's a cool. Like bikes are cool. They're cooler than they've ever been. You can do a heck of a lot with a six hundred dollar bike. Um, yeah. But you, if you're riding a lot and have the means to do so, you probably will be back soon for maybe a full suspension bike. Right. So that, that first bike, it's okay. It almost kind of doesn't matter what it is. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, I think or there's a, bu a big budgetary question here, right? So like if, if you have the means, I recommend gambling on trying to guess what the first one should be. Okay. Uh, and maybe spend a little bit more money and get like an all around full suspension bike that leans towards whatever your ride fantasy is. Okay. And I think it, that is an important thing is start with some reflection on your ride fantasy mm, okay. because there are a lot of mountain bike ride fantasies to me, maybe almost this conversation begins at what is your ride fantasy? That's usually how I start the conversation in the shop. Mm. So I'll ask like, Hey, do you picture yourself doing long days covering a lot of miles? Do you picture both wheels on the ground? Like when you see yourself on this new bike, what's the image in your mind? Are you at the bike mm -hmm. park? Are you at a local park? Are you with friends? Are you alone? How many miles are you doing? Are you doing it? Are you measuring your heart rate or are you measuring how far you're jumping? Like, this is awesome. See, this is what's great is because I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of shops. There's a lot of people who would, kind of judge you for that judge you for thinking like having a fantasy about what kind of writing you want to do 
And I think it's great that you're encouraging it. You're saying like, this is, a, this is where you need to start from because it's, it's not about the bike. It's not about all those things. It's about like, what do you as a human want to do on this bike? Yeah. Mountain biking is a really broad category as it turns out. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See wh- what I find interesting is when I got into mountain biking, my ride fantasy was like long days, single track, you know, pretty much XC style riding. Um, and probably, you know, three months in, I was like out in the field trying to build a jump right? and jump, jump on it on like my 29 or hardtail. Right. And make no mistake, your ride fan, your ride fantasy will probably change. And if it doesn't, <laughs> it, you might not be doing it right. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, agreed. My ride fantasy can change with the seasons, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to a degree. Although there's always kind of some underlying threads. Like I like the wind in my hair. I like the feeling of waiting and unwaiting. I like turning my bike, Hmm. but yeah, some days I, some days my ride fantasy is to sit and pedal up a hill for three hours. Hmm. So yeah, 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 yeah. I totally get that. So starting with your ride fantasy. And uh, so let's say, let's kind of break that down a little bit. Can you, do you think that there's maybe, a couple of categories of ride fantasies that somebody might walk in with? Yeah. Um, I think that you ha- there's a kind of a few different spectrums you sort of want to find out where you live on or mm-hmm. where you see yourself on. So one spectrum, it, well, so one thing is just where are you going to ride? That, yeah, okay. So are you going wh- to, where do you live? Are you going to ride close to where you live? Is there a destination or are there destinations that you plan to ride? So that can really help inform your decision based on the terrain where you're going to ride. Okay. That's the, can you hear that siren going off? Just, just barely. Just barely. It's the volunteer fire department. Um, Oh, that's right. Yeah. I actually remember that from the, from the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, (laughs) um, I think destination is a good way to start figuring out your ride fantasy. I also think if you're going to ride with a group, I'm usually not one to follow a herd or to do what my friends do, but, when it comes to riding, if you're going to ride with a group, your ride fantasy might end up adjacent to the ride fantasy of that group. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. might be a good clue. Where are they riding? What's their ride fantasy? What kind of bikes are they on? Right. It's um, interesting. Um, we were going to save some of the questions, but so- a couple of people asked about like, I, you know, um, I want to ride at the park. I want to do enduro riding and they're like throwing terms out, you know, and that sounds like that's kind of they're exposing a little bit of like what their ride fantasy is. Yeah. These 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 labels are fun. I feel like it they can be a little bit broad and a little bit kind of easy to use without establishing a mutual understanding of what we're saying when we say them. Okay. Like in like bike park and enduro are both very broad experiences to me. Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. I could ride I could ride my tall boy at any local bike park and have fun, but it wouldn't probably be the bike I would bring. Mm -hmm. It might be the fastest bike for me at a lot of local Enduros, but it's not my most Enduro bike. Yeah. So there's like, like that conversation. So I like to really break it down to more like what kind of terrain, how fast are you trying to go in uphill? Is that uphill, downhill, both? Mm -hmm. Um, do you do you want a bike that can you can do do kind of like jibby mid speed stuff on too like mm-hmm. almost like dirt jumpy stuff and, and like tricks or do you right. really just want a bike that's good for going because f- even within the enduro category there's the really s- super playful nimble end of that range and the very stable long not nimble end of that range right like, yeah yeah like almost more race style. Yeah, well, and also like course, what course, right? Like big right. mountain race style. How about like right. big Hor- open horses mountain race? Horses, right? Yeah. So I, so it sounds like we're talking about that second bike, right? You've you've got your first bike. You've got a feel for like what kind of riding you want to do. Maybe or maybe let's take a step back and say you don't, but you can still explore these questions. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people underestimate. Um, new riders ability to know things about themselves and even to tell what bikes are comfortable to them. And a lot of people, new riders will often come in the shop with a very like, I don't know, I'm new. I can't tell if it's comfortable. 
And if you start asking them a little bit more probing questions and give them some confidence, like, well, does, you know, does your neck feel relaxed? Does your back feel relaxed? Is there a lot of pressure on your hands? Next thing you know, they're like, oh, this is the most comfortable one. Like, <laughs> that's cool. Um, actually, somebody asked about that. They said, we, we kind of brought that up earlier and I'm trying to find it about the torso. Uh, John Crisp asked, do different body types make a difference in the bike to choose? Uh, long torso, short torso. I think so to a degree. Yeah. Um, if you have a, sh if you have a long torso, you're probably going to have, you want a bike that has a lot, maybe preferably kind of a lot of standover and preferably a short seat tube for its size, mm -hmm. because you're going to want a lot of reach for that torso, but probably don't have really long legs for your height. Okay. So that's me. I ride a medium and I'm not quite five, eight and I have like the torso of a normal size person and the legs of a very short person. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't necessarily want to get into brands, but are there a couple of brands that, um, that have that good, uh, standover and short seat tubes? Uh, luckily that's the, tr for those of us that have that build, that's the trend in the industry. Okay. So most progressive brands do. Um, Kona transition pivot all come to mind. Santa Cruz, like a lot of the brands we sell do. And even the ones who don't by modern standards do by historical standards. Mm -hmm. So like the average, like a, a 16 and a half or a 17 inch C2 might be long by today's standards, but it's really short, for a medium mm -hmm. might be it's short by historical standards. Got it. So here's a good question. How, Okay, if somebody's out there getting a used bike. Hey, can I just answer, go back to that other question for a sec? Yeah, 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 sorry. For the shorter torso, longer leg rider, I would veer towards a bike with a long head tube because your seat's going to be way up in the air and you want that taller stack. Uh -huh. You can also address that with riser bars and, mm -hmm. and or like um, make sure all the spacers are below your stem. But like if you have your seat way up in the air, you might need to get your bars higher up in the air. Got it. Are there a couple of brands you can think of that have that? Um, Kona tends to have long top, long head tubes. Mm -hmm. um, I think Transition does too. Okay. Um, but also maybe just look at a high rise bar if you're that person. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And maybe and even with maybe look for the steeper seat angles and not the longest reaches if uh, but a lot of times that person also has long arms. So kind of all you do at the end have to just figure out what's comfortable for you. Right. right. And for the shorter leg rider, try to look for a bike where the seat post goes in really far so that you can get the seat nice and low. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, uh I think it was a pivot. It was I think bef before the Mach 6, I think they had still had kind of long seat tubes um, at the time, and I couldn't get the seat down far enough, and I was trying to ride the luge, and I felt like I was going to go over the bars like the whole time. Yeah. My friend Andrew describes that as it used to feel like you were sitting on top of a square, and now you're sitting inside a rectangle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what it felt like. Yeah. That wasn't fun. Um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, now I kind of lost my train of thought what i was going to ask you about but. oh man my i, I ramble and no. i do that to people no 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 i you you were trying to fully answer the question and i and i and i didn't uh i didn't uh, let you do that um how about this one i'm just looking at your questions do you mind if i pick one dude go for it i was wondering how much front brake you should use when going down a hill oh man that's not even on topic i'm sorry i suck <laughs> it's not even how to pick a bike <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to it. I did want to, okay. I did want to answer that one too. Once we get into like some technique and stuff. Um, so uh, I think one of the other aspects to maybe to take into account is your level of fitness, right? Definitely. Um, cause like if you're, if you've got the ride fantasy of like, you want to do like big jumps or, or bike park or whatnot, but you're still new to mountain biking. Um, and the bike park's not open and you don't necessarily have a bunch of friends who are going to shuttle you, you got to pedal that thing up the hill. Yep. Um, so what would you suggest for that person? So you're, you're not fit. Let's, and let's say you're not buying an e-bike. 
It's right. That kind of, um, sure. And how not fit are we here? Are we like 325 pounds? Uh, let's say, um, let's say, uh, you're not like, just like, like hugely overweight, but you're like, your cardio isn't great. Like, like, let's say you're going to like, kind of like feel like you're going to die climbing up like old, like climbing up shoots, like, mm -hmm. uh, like the shoots climb. Is this someone who kind of likes that feeling and has like a history with that feeling? Uh, I know, I, say, I know that's a weird question, but no, no, I, I get it because that could be a, 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 a like a, a collegiate or high school athlete who is into sure. suffering, but has like fallen off, you know, like I get that, but let's make it hard and say that like, they're not, they're like, they're going to be, their body's going to be in shock. They're going to puke on the first climb, on the first like 500 <laughs> foot climb. Yes. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe, maybe start with some chill rides. Like if the like if you're local to us, we have like the back bay trails, which are, don't have a lot of hills. Mm -hmm. Do some back rides. Bay trails? Yeah, like over they're just dirt paths around the back bay, or um, or Aliso Woods has routes you can do that don't go up onto the ridge lines, or mm -hmm. figure out a way to do a ride that has a hundred feet or so of climbing, just to kind of get used to your bike and maybe do a few of those. And see how challenging that is for you before you start hit, hitting like legit mountain bike trails. That would be one thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the whole as it as it applies to picking the right bike. You know, there's a lot that goes in. Like if you're really really heavy and you just need to lose, like if you're like in that over 300 category, you might want to do a hardtail and try to lose some weight before you go full suspension. But at the mm -hmm. same time, you might not. <laughs> like you might really benefit from that and and every you, my main message here is going to go over and over again back to this figure out what smart questions are to ask yourself and ask yourself and don't underestimate your ability to know yourself got it got it so like if you're out of shape but you are graceful that means one thing mm -hmm. like no i'm out of shape but i'm a graceful person mm -hmm. or no like i'm hard on equipment like you need to ask yourself these questions. Am I, have I been hard on other equipment or does my <laughs> stuff tend not to break? Like, that's an important question. That's so cool. I like how this turns into like a full on, like self-awareness, self-reflection exercise. Yeah. Yeah. That might be just my, my spirit coming through. Yes. Well, you, I understand you to be a, a student of philosophy. Did you freeze? Yeah, for sure. I think, I'm back. I think you froze there for a second. Yeah, you're back. Yeah. Um, cool. So well, how about this? This is a question I often, I, I kind of, I know I thought about this, like coming into mountain biking and, I, and I've kind of heard it a few times. It's like, uh, I just want something that is going to be my like quiver killer. I like, I want the one bike that I can pedal up San Juan. I can uh, take to snow summit i can like do all these things and to kind of unpack that i can do a big long arduous climb but i can also go to the bike park and, and send it off of jumps like, yeah how does that how does that person find that bike i would say get a good mid-travel trail bike okay what that is that is, what does that look like mid-travel uh it could be anywhere between like maybe 120 millimeters of travel up to like maybe 150 okay depending on and then th there's shades and all of these things right yeah and I would and say when you, when you say ahead. those numbers, those are you're you're targeting the shock at this point, right? Yeah, kind of the the front suspension or the rear suspension or kind of the average of them or something like that. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, I never know because sometimes people will say that they'll say like it's like a hundred and thirty bike, it's a hundred thirty mil bike, and I'm always like, is that they're talking about the shock, or they because I feel like that's kind of where it makes the most difference, right? The rear or the front. Yeah, like yeah, name to a number. degree, but I think also, okay, so let's really get into ride fantasies and intended use a little bit on this because yeah. you can see a you can see, say, for example, a hundred and thirty mil travel bike that is a full on what I would call a down country bike, which means the ride fantasy is it's almost no compromises on climbing and efficiency and being lightweight, but just a little bit of compromises to still be fun on rowdy or downhills. Mm -hmm. So there's that version of a, say five inch travel trail bike. And then the other end of that spectrum is 
it's got the same geometry as the big hitting enduro bikes and it maybe weighs just about as much but it just has less travel right yeah and i think that's actually a really good point like you can't just look at the travel right look at the weight look at the head angle and the seat i'd say the. I think head angle is often overemphasized as a metric to look at, mm-hmm. but in, when you're when you want to look at the the design language of a bike, it's a really good indicator of what the designers were thinking. Okay, so so the lower the number, the yeah, lower so- the number, it's going to be more stable at speed but less agile, mm-hmm. and um, a longer wheelbase with the lower number in general. Mm-hmm. So. That lower number on the head angle means that the design language of the bike emphasizes like the rowdier downhill and high speed. Okay. I think like what's the Nomad at right now? I think it's like probably 64. 64, I can look it up real quick. I think in the high, I think it's 64 and then like 63 and a half or something on the low. Yeah, that sounds about right. And the Nomad's a dual 27 and a half inch bike and Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, um, when you look at a 29er, the number is generally going to often be a degree or two steeper than the 27 and a half to get in some ways the same steering dynamic. Oh, okay. I didn't didn't know that. So for those who like are totally new to it, right? A 64, 63 and a half is like pretty dang slack. Like that's almost, or that's in the range of like a D- DH bike even. Right. Right. So this um, is someone who wants to go fast on chunky and or steep trails mm-hmm. that have big bumps and big and or big drops or big hits. Mm-hmm. I would say, and someone who's willing to give up some agility and flippiness, like that person who wants to do a lot of like bunny hoppy moves at like kind of mid speed jibby moves. They might mm-hmm. not like that as much, right? Or like the really steep jumps. Like that bike's good for the less vertical jumps like you see at a bike park and not as good for like BMX type jumps, you know? Right, right. So what's like the uh, uh, head angle, head to head angle? Oh my God. Head to angle. And again, <laughs> the, angle. these are all rules oh, like, of thumb. You yeah, can't yeah, just yeah. look at one and know what the bike is because some pe- you know, some brands like say Transition, they're going to put a really slack head angle on all of their bikes because right. that's part of their design language and their their riding style that they're serving yeah but but yeah so go ahead yeah but for the person who's like brand new and they just kind of need some some sort of rule of thumb to go off of like like what would like a down country like head to bangle kind of look like they i would say what is considered steep these days it, on, on a trail bike is somewhere around 67 68 degrees okay and okay. that you will find down. I, I would say for most of our riding in this terrain, I would suggest looking for something a little slacker than that, even for your like down country bike. Yeah. Because yeah. it's just a little twitchy and like, you know, this, the bigger that number is, it's easier to go over the bars because your wheels more tucked underneath you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and well, also think- the whole design language of the bike will be around like less steep downhills, usually right. with that steeper head angle. Okay. We have a lot of steep downhills in SoCal. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was going to mention is, you know, like, I think most of my audience, a lot of my audience is, is in Southern California. So I think if you're getting started in Southern California, it is better to get something with a little bit of a slacker head tube angle, meaning a lower, lower number, you know, 65, 64, somewhere in there, because it doesn't take long before you're on something steep and, and, and even just even steep and maybe also chunky. It's like yeah. really easy to do that here. A lot of brands are really good clue to the design language of the bike. If you're, if you don't want to get into all the technical stuff is just look at the tires. Ooh, that's so like a okay, lo- yeah. the bikes that are meant for covering a lot of miles efficiently are going to tend to have lower knobs, especially on the back tire, but even on the front tire, mm-hmm. they're going to tend to be in that like two, three, two, 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 four range of width. Okay. And they're going to be like, a Maxxis EXO is kind of like a heavy casing in that world mm-hmm. where in the other worlds we're talking about, that's kind of like a light casing. So, right. So on the other side of that, you might see more like two, five, two, five, maybe even two, six with mm-hmm. bigger knobs. And, and the further you go, 
towards that kind of rowdy riding style you would see bigger and bigger knobs and if you see a bike that comes with a, a heavy duty casing on the tire that bike's probably really designed for like you know more much more emphasis on high speed confidence and much less emphasis on climbing efficiency and agility oh, and all that that's a really good point i had never thought about that and actually it's funny you say that because i just started kind of paying attention to that because i noticed like uh on the santa cruz nomad coil like the coil builds they're specced with like i think i think they're specced with like double downs that um, sounds right yeah they're like a little bit more chunky i just remembered the question i was going to ask you sweet so let's talk for a minute about the used market um there's a couple of things we can get into there, but I think the first, I mean, we can get into like, what do you want to look for? What are some like no goes like, you know, but I think maybe a good place to start is like, does it matter how old the bike is? Definitely. Right. So how far back would you, uh, would you suggest somebody? What, what's it's, the it's a tricky question because I think people should have bikes and they should get a bike they can afford and they should feel good about it. Mm hmm. And I don't want to like put someone in a spot where the bike th that they can get, I'm telling them it's not, it's too far back. <laughs> right. um, but let's say, let's say you can afford it and you're just trying to like save some money on the used market or can't find a bike at your local shop or mm -hmm. whatever. I would say don't go back more than two years. Okay. Okay. And part of that is the, the evolution of technology. And part of that is just how much how much life a bike might have lost over that. I mean, so how much use it might have seen that's hard to tell. Right. Yeah. Um, I think kind of one thing, one dynamic that I just thought of was, you know, the a used bike will have depreciated, but what if, you know, if you look at that number, you're, you know, you're thinking of spending on that used bike, what can you get new? Right. For that same number. You know, if you're looking at a used bike that's two thousand dollars, like seems like you could walk into a bike shop and pick up something for two thousand dollars that's gonna like especially for your first bike, that's gonna make you really happy. Maybe, although the dynamic right now with the inventory supply issues is yeah. challenging at, at times. Well, yeah, let's come back to that. We need to discuss that, I think. Yeah. What I would say is, you know, you want to find a bike from someone who has who values their time more than you and who has probably makes more money than you and probably got a bike and then didn't get into it. Like that's your dream find. right there. <laughs> so you want a bike that clearly has barely been ridden. That's what used yeah. bike you want. Yeah. Like in my opinion, do you think like, if like, I, I don't want to totally get into like how to, how to buy a used bike. Like what's the, Oh, a hundred dollars in each pocket and, and another hundred dollars <laughs> in your sock. Just kidding. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I just, I just kind of want to throw this out there. Like if, can you, do you think like walking into the person's garage, like looking at their garage, looking at like how their setup is, can tell you a little bit? Yeah. If they, I mean, I wouldn't invite a stranger into my garage, so maybe it means they're nuts, but yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. You know, if, if, if they seem like they take good care of their stuff, they probably do. If, yeah. if their stuff seems well taken care of, they might, yeah. it might be true. Okay. Although you can see my workshop is a total mess, but the oh. things I care about are pretty well taken care of. And my oh. workshop is a mess because it's my own mess and it's like, I know where everything is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks more, it looks more organized than mine. The shop <laughs> workshop is not like that because it has to be a, um, a community space. Yeah, that, that place is a machine, man. I've, I've looked back there. It's like, it's like run well. Um, yeah, so um, not more than two years back. Um, if you can. Yeah. You want a bike uh, that someone thought they were going to ride that they didn't ride, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. In a best case. Um, or, or somebody who just does turn over a bike every year or two. Yes, and takes great care of them. Yes, that can be good. Got it. Got it. Although a lot of times that person rides kind of a lot. 
Yeah. And they know how to keep their bikes looking good, but that doesn't mean like the fork doesn't need to rebuild and the rear shock doesn't mean to re maybe the chain stretched out even like you never know. Right. And I'll add that the person, the, the new rider, you know, there's a lot that comes with the purchase from a good shop, including kind of, I, don't, I wouldn't say that you're going to get preferential treatment from a shop that you buy a bike from, but it's part of building a relationship with a shop. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. it helps build a relationship and having a relationship with a shop can be a really good thing. And then also, you know, a good shop is going to help you set up the suspension, give you tips on how to lube the chain and like how to check the bolt torque and how to get your bike set up and what tools to carry. Like you're going to get more than just the bike from a good shop. So yeah. that's important to remember. And the, if you're looking at the value equation, um, I would I would go out on a limb and say we probably provide, if you utilize it, minimum of like $100 of free service when you buy a bike from us, just with the free tune-up and the free suspension tuning and some help with the setup. Mm -hmm. And then if you need a lot of help, it can turn into, you know, with, the, with warranty issues and stuff like that. If you're unlucky, it can turn into a lot of of support that you could end up needing and getting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i've experienced that um and that's maybe that actually is kind of an, another good question right it's like the money versus the value right um i know when i was looking for a bike i was looking for a shop that i could depend on you know and i, I just hadn't had good experiences with some of the shops that are close by me um you know i purchased a bike from them because i wanted a relationship with them um so would you say that uh, somebody just getting into mountain biking should sounds like they should take that into account too? Like, what you know, especially if with? you can find a shop that you do work well with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, maybe there's not a shop in your area that kind of resonates with your style or your values, or that does a good job. Even maybe, although I think most areas have a shop somewhere that does a good, pretty good job, mm -hmm. um, or that's going to see you for for who you are as a rider or whatever. You know, it can be hard to find the right shop for you. And there are a lot of good mail order shops and, um, and there's a lot of great information on YouTube and in the community, and you can maybe find some friends to help you through all this stuff. Um, so I wouldn't want to try to say that the shop is the only avenue for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say that even for the most experienced rider, a good relationship with a shop that sees the, them for the rider they are and caters to them can be invaluable. If you can yeah. find it. Yeah, totally. Um, I feel like we've covered some good things. Um, let's say uh, you've got the person who's, let's kind of delve a little bit more into that like second bike, right? Um, if they're... Uh, How do I put this? If they're like, um, wow, <laughs> I might even edit this part out. I totally lost my train of thought. Uh, uh, actually, okay, that's what it was. So we we kind of talked about this. I'm just totally switching gears. We we talked about this a little bit. Like um, we talked about how you might have a group of friends, right, that are going to kind of influence your your. Uh, your ride fantasy. And that's kind of maybe going to influence the kind of bike you're going to get. They're probably going to give you a lot of advice on that. Um, if you're totally just getting into this and, and you, you, you maybe don't even have enough information to, to have a ride fantasy. Like you've just come in, you, you know, people get on bikes and they go on the dirt like, um, uh, and they don't have much to work with to build a ride fantasy. Do you, would you say they would still maybe still have a, a ride fantasy? I bet you they do. Yeah. I bet you if, if they're honest with you and you ask them like, Hey, you got this, you're going to have this new bike. Picture yourself on it. What do you see? They see something. Got it. That's and it cool. might, it might even just be the question. Like, are they going uphill or downhill? Like they have an, they have a picture in their head of one of those two, probably most likely. <laughs> right that's so cool yeah um sweet man so we've been going a little bit i think we've covered some really good things uh do you want to jump into some rapid fire questions hit it okay um so 
Do you think it matters if somebody gets, this is kind of coming from Prios underscore like 27.5 or 29er for, mm. and I, I, I'm assuming they're talking about like for a beginner. Right. I'd say the right one for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes back to the ride fantasy, right? But if you can't pick all of the things being equal, get a 29er. Okay. They're more popular with more riders. It's a, it's a safer bet just by virtue of that. Nice. Okay. Uh, this is, I think this is a good question, um, from Cadden, Cadden M wall. Why is a full suspension bike worth more? Um, it costs money to make the pivots and the rear shock and it, um, there's just a design and production cost that goes into that. Well, and then the question of value as in like, why would it be worth more to me is, um, comfort and safety. Yeah. Ed, can you unpack that a little bit? The, the comfort I get the safety part. Talk about that. I, uh, you have more control with good suspension than with no suspension. Even That's just like a, any, any vehicle is more safe, even with better suspension than worse suspension. Hmm. So it's just, it's just not more bouncy. So they slow down with more control. They corner with more control. And they, uh, they'll probably have better grip, um, more, uh, uh, on the ground, which gives you more control over bumping for cornering ground. and breaking. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's a couple here I want to get to, but I want to save until later. Um, let's see. Uh, so we answered this one about the amount of travel from Josh DH. Um, uh, so here's a nice one, which is a little bit weird, but it, it's not exactly about beginner bikes, but I think it maybe helps choosing a bike. Um, Jason for how often do people actually claim warranty issues on new bikes or is it safe to buy a used bike? Good br brands that um, have, have a good reputation for this, which include Santa Cruz, Kona, Pivot, most of the brands we sell. And, you know, some of the, and also to the brands that don't have the very lightest bikes. So like some of the brands we sell do have a little lighter bikes than some of the brands I just listed in category. And they mm -hmm. do break a little more sometimes. Hmm. But um, the, the top performing brands, from what I understand, have a one and a half to 3% warranty rate. One and a half to three so one and a half to three percent of the bikes that get sold, someone submits a warranty claim on, or maybe that's how many they approve the warranty claim on, how many they feel are actually defective. Okay, I think that's what that number is. Like Pivot was once bragging to me, I think that it was about. I'm not going to say the number, but it was low. It was in the lower part of that range. Right. I think they might also, and I I think some people will uh, confuse warranty with crash replacement. Right. So just the likelihood of failure is a little bit higher than one and a half to three percent, especially if you're pushing the limits and, and or crashing. Um, if you you oftentimes a crash replacement might be available to a secondhand customer, but it's often not the same deal. So even as a secondhand customer, say you break your front triangle. Mm -hmm. Usually, from most major brands, a front triangle can be had for under a thousand bucks. So okay. it's not like the end of the world, end of the world, but it, and that's a carbon front triangle. An okay. aluminum one usually is more like six. And on the crash replacements, sometimes it's anywhere from like 20 to 40% off of that. And these are just real rough numbers, but right, right. Um, but it's also that's just the frame. What, you still might have a warranty on your fork. You might have a warranty on your brakes. You might have a warranty on your seat post. You might not have a warranty on your seat post, but you might over clamp it and just need a shop to explain that it won't move if you over tighten the clamp bolt or any number of things. Like there's a lot of just port that you might need that isn't even a warranty thing. You know, going back to the the shop relationship, um, I know there's things that like I totally wouldn't have known about uh, if I didn't have a relationship with the path. Like, for instance, there was something with one of the one of my brake calipers, not calipers, one of the pistons or something that uh, 
I didn't know about. I didn't know that my break wasn't really working well. And I think Brandon was like, hey, you know, did you know they're doing replacements on these things? And I can, you know, like, you don't even have to report it. I can warranty it for you. And bing, bang, boom. And the, the break worked better. You learn the difference between A level and B level breaking. Yeah. That moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And better breaks let you go faster. Um, so this, um, there's, there's one from average Chad that I want to save till later, but here's a good one, um, which maybe might lead to a separate question, but from Jay Durez, uh, how often should a bike be replaced? Um, he's riding a 250, 20, uh, 2015 hardtail with modern geo. Yeah. I mean, that really goes to a lot of your personal values, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I like to replace a bike every eight to tw eight to 12 months before it takes its second major depreciation. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's another major depreciation somewhere around 24 months. Okay. Um, at that point, And then pretty quickly after that, it devalues to like way less than half of your value, you know? Mm. Okay. So if you're looking at trying to get something out of your previous bike, there's one question answer, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're trying to say, like, I have this theory that say, like, I can ride as a customer, I can ride a $6,000 bike all the time. That's less than 12 months old. If I pay like 1500 to $2,000 a year after my initial investment. Yeah. So and if I'm running that, that's one option. The other, other extreme is run it into the ground, which is all like, there's a lot of value there. You get a lot of value out of your equipment. It's good for the environment. It's, it's sustainable. It's, um, it's a great financial decision in a lot of cases. So that's a good point. I think there's an aspect there that, that I know I kind of fell into, which is like when I, you know, was a new rider, I was just learning skills and I tended to associate the skills I had learned with the bike that I was riding. So it was frightening to try a different bike, you know, like, Oh, the suspension is the clicks are different. Right. This one might have more clicks than the other one. Um, and it wasn't you, until I go ahead. Your comfort zone broadens with experience. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think what really opened that up for me was demoing all the bikes. Like you guys had like a demo fair and I think I had like rented a bunch of bikes a bunch of times and suddenly realized that, you know, my skills were in, in me, you know, they, they were communicated through the bike, but they were in, you know, in my body and in my brain. And, and that made me a lot more willing to switch up bikes more regularly. Right. And some yeah. bikes might bolster certain skills and, and kind of reel in others. And some bikes might kind of almost dare you to try something new. Yeah. But yeah. And there's something I've heard you guys say on the podcast about like, sometimes you, you can use it as a coach, you know, your bike can coach you into certain techniques. Um, here's a, a, a nice one uh, kind of talking about like, keeping your it's related to keeping your bike and kind of running it into the ground, which is from Zoe Duenas, which one or two component upgrades would you invest in for beginner uh, to mountain biking? Okay. So assuming that everything is kind of working adequately for the rider, mm -hmm. I would say fork and wheels, but if your brakes aren't good enough and it might be hard to know if they are, if you haven't ever had brakes that are good enough, that might um, leapfrog. Like if <laughs> yeah. you need to have good enough brakes, yeah. but if you, let's say your brakes are already kind of good enough and your suspension is kind of good enough and your wheels are kind of good enough, mm -hmm. I would say fork and wheels, but that's also the most expensive options probably. Yeah. And, if, I, and I think you're, I think you're also talking to the non-consumables, right? Because like your tires are going to wear out, you're going to have to replace those. And those are the opportunity to upgrade them. Right. They are also a huge tuning option on your bike tires. Yeah. So like an inexpensive thing to play around with for sure to change the personality of your bike is tires. Totally. Go tubeless. If you haven't yeah. gone tubeless, do that. I know like that was the first thing I did to the, to that XC 29er and it was a different bike. Uh, that's kind of, that's my tip. That's my, that's my one tip. <laughs> it's a good one. And look yeah. for a bike that's tube that, that comes with tubeless tires and tubeless rims. If it's your first bike, I would look for that. That will also speak to this bike is 
designed and specced by real riders who want it to be a good experience for you and are looking out for your interests. I think that there's some there's kind of a um, a subtext there when you see the bike that has the tubeless tires and rims, especially in the price points where you don't see it as much. I mean, at a certain price point, if you don't see it, it's like what's going on here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I've seen that. Uh, this is uh this is a good one from Average Chad. When picking a bike, what's something that is a non-negotiable? And I, I kind of want to split that into two uh, versions of the question. And one is for like a new bike, um, which I think is maybe a little bit easier to answer, um, but also a used bike. I think fit. I think bike. I think it needs to fit. I think it mm-hmm. needs to be a good size for you. How much do you need to do to figure out if it fits? <sighs> Well, for the most part, the rules of thumb will usually work, especially if you're not in one of those heights that's in the kind of middle of a lot of people's size range. So like if you're 5'10", it can be tough to pick between a medium and a large. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But for most people, you need to tell someone your height and they're going to be like, yeah, if they know a lot about it, they're going to more or less adjust a size that is likely right. Right. And if you're an outlier, you might know it. You might be like, no, I have weird proportions. Nothing ever fits me the way it's supposed to. Or like if you're very tall or very short, sometimes fit can be more complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but like if you're six foot, you're almost for sure large. If you're five eight, you're almost for sure a medium. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. If yeah, you're yeah. six two, you're almost for sure an extra large. Like, right. So, especially if you're buying a used bike, if you're, five five and somebody's got a you can see a sweet deal on a large whatever probably don't get that one right so non-negotiable it needs to fit good enough you we can get into like oh some extra larges are longer than others and that Mm -hmm. that's like the next layer of fit i wouldn't know i wouldn't say that's necessarily non-negotiable though okay that it'd be like a perfect fit it just has to be a good enough fit to be non-negotiable i never remember when uh uh Kelly's uh, shock blew up uh, a, like what was it, two years ago um, and we were up at snow summit. And so that like the first, we were up there for a weekend and the first day her shock blew up. And the second day I rented her a Trek remedy and they, and she normally rides a small, they only had mediums. And she was like, yeah, I can, I can ride a medium too. Yeah. yeah. She bought like Is five, like five or something. Five, two. Oh, okay. Five. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, so that's five, five. probably outside the range of that's you can still ride it because bikes are fun, but that's a not a good <laughs> fit, right? Like, yeah, no, no. I, I think it were also because we were at the bike park having a little bit of a bigger bike. Uh, uh, she she kind of liked that a little bit. You um, know, I think too, if you're really short, you might be kind of used to riding bikes that are a little big sometimes. And likewise, I've noticed really tall people don't understand how big of a bike they need because they're like, well, large feels fine. It's like, no, <laughs> like try a big bike. Like, did, did you, did you notice that when I went on that ride with Brandon, he was on a medium? Mm. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think that was a good idea, but <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Uh, he's an experimenter. He likes to, exp- he's, he's got a lot of curiosity. Dude. He, uh, yeah, he, um, he definitely took care of that bike though. He rode it like a BMX bike. It was like, it was great to see. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of scanning through. I'm not really seeing, uh, any of the questions that we really want to jump into unless you saw any that you wanted to jump into. Oh, there was the question about front brake. How much front brake should you use? Uh, while going, uh, you know, I think a braking tip is a great thing. Some braking tips are great for any beginner. I would say if you're going straight, Mm-hmm. And you have front wheel traction, you should use most like a lot of front brake. You don't want to use your front brake in a turn. Right. You shouldn't be braking at all in a turn. But if you can't stop yourself, don't don't touch the front brake in the turn. Okay. That was from Carly Colgan. I was wondering how much front brake should you use when going down a hill? I think some people say about 80%. And that but I think that's assuming that you're going in a straight line with decent traction. And then yeah. um it's going to vary depending on the steepness of the terrain. Like the, the steeper it is, the less your rear brake is really going to help much. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing I would say, just while we're talking about braking, that I think a lot of beginners can really benefit from is short bursts of braking and braking when you don't braking before you think you need to slow down 
before the feature, before the turn, before the rough, rocky section, so that you enter the challenging section at a manageable speed that you can be off the brakes on. Is mm-hmm. It's good for your brakes. It's good for your riding. It'll make you a smoother rider. But And that kind of constant dragging of the brake that feels safe, that really heats your brakes up. And it's really hard on your brake system. Yeah. Yeah. And also your suspension tends, most bikes, their suspension works better when you're not braking. Is that correct? Definitely. Definitely. And also everything works better when you're not braking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that took me a long time to figure out. Um, and especially a lot of the trails, you know, we were talking about earlier in Southern California, they have pretty steep sections and steep sections where it, if you're trying to brake on them, even if you're using your front brake, you're, you're going to slide because you're usually on rock or something like that and figuring out that, uh, braking b- right before the feature and then knowing when to just let go. Right. Um, until and you then learning modulation. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, can you unpack brake modulation just a little bit? So it's the idea that um, you want to control the braking power that you're applying so that it's enough to slow you down, but not enough to cause a loss of traction, which mm-hmm. ultimately is a loss of control. And without getting too much into I like I'm, if Nathan or Hawk were here, they could probably check my work on this. But I think there's something called like a friction coefficient where <laughs> once you break it, you've lost friction. It, you, you have like an amount of friction and that goes way down once the friction is broken. Like so the like, friction of the tire to the ground. Once you start skidding, it's harder to gain control than it is to keep control basically is the moral right. of the story, I think. So you yeah. want to use enough brake to slow down, but not enough to cause like a skid. Mm-hmm. That's always my goal. Like I, right. like I, it's, it's hard to do in places like Aliso, but trying to make it so that like my tires are are either stopped or rolling, but yeah. never, never like, yeah, never at, slide. At some of the riding clinics I've been part of, one of the exercises is just how fast can you slow down from one spot on a downhill to another over and over again and practicing, trying to Ooh. shorten the amount of distance it takes to slow down. And nice. it's all about that brake modulation. So this isn't about, this actually made me think of something. This isn't about buying a bike, but I think like some some words for beginners. How early do you think a beginner mountain biker should get coaching, go to a clinic? Mm. I mean, things are a little bit weird right now because of COVID, but yeah. I think coaching is great. Um, I've never been coached. Maybe I should have. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I think, especially if you're that kind of person who likes that kind of formal instruction, Mm -hmm. um, I'm more that guy that would rather go fishing and not catch fish without a guide than have a guide and catch fish. <laughs> so maybe I'm it. the wrong person to ask, but I also really appreciate a skill I'm working on is being able to um, get help and find resources for help in ways and times when I need it. So mm. I would say like coaching is probably would probably be a great example of that. Yeah. I I'd say to anybody who is interested in mountain biking, maybe has already gotten into it, but feels um, intimidated either by the trails or by the other mountain bikers. Like if you're that person, uh, you're definitely a person who could benefit from coaching um, because you're going to be interacting with another mountain biker who has a passion for the sport. um, And you're going to become, you're going to, it's going to give you a little bit of a better entry into mountain biking. Yeah. Um, or at least find an expert buddy or two or a good group to ride with that's supportive and kind and like helps or, or find a good shop ride. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Which is kind of on hold right now at a lot of shops, but yeah, it's on hold at ours. Yeah. Actually, speaking of COVID, um, which we were kind of doing indirectly there, we were going to talk a little bit about like getting a bike right now. Um, and some of the dynamics, some of the realities and maybe some suggestions. I think more than ever, you have to know what style of bike you want because you might not be getting the model and brand you had in mind. Um, Mm -hmm. but that could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. You might learn something along the way. Um, 
be patient. You may, you probably want to come with a little bit of patience. I would, as a bike shop owner, this is a stupid thing to say, but um, maybe wait if you don't need, if you have a bike, like, I guess that's not for new riders. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, for a new rider who needs a new bike. So the, those bikes in the lower price points, like under $3,000 even are the most challenging uh, right now in terms of the supply shortage. So mm-hmm. that is rough. And, and the reason is because we have so many new riders. So we have a lot to be thankful for in our community in having all the new riders. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I would say it depends. It, it depends. I think what style of bike you're looking at and what, what your needs are. But like, if you're shopping at the path, um, go find a few bikes on our website and hit the back install alert. And you'll get an email as soon as they come back in stock. Nice. Um, I call around, check websites. I don't know. To be honest, like um, my job right now, part of it is helping our buyer, like find some of these bikes to buy. And so the answer from my perspective is it might take some perseverance and some patience. Yeah. But, but it'll, it, you know what? Don't lose hope. Bike shops are getting bikes. Mm-hmm. They sell really fast when they do get them a lot of times in those price points right now. But, um, you know, figure out how your bike shop works. Like if it's the path, you can put a deposit on a bike, but then you might miss the way things are going now. There might be a different one that comes in that comes in and sells without you even realizing that you would have been happy with. Mm. So it's really dynamic and fluid. I would say, the, um, either find one that seems like there's an ETA that's that you can live with and also assume that it might change, right? Like be ready mm-hmm. for that possibility. And then, um, or just be ready and like have your feelers out. And like, when you see one, that's the right one for you, jump on it. Yeah. I would say <laughs> that's, that's what I did. I was like, I don't even need to see it. I don't even need to see it. Just like, here's, here's my money. <laughs> take my did money get, yeah take my money did you guys sell the uh those other nomads you got in yeah but then you know our mike our rep calls them easter egg bikes sometimes like bikes pop up that other dealers couldn't take for some reason or another so we got a few more nomads oh nice so you have some in stock like right now yeah yeah what's what's the date it's february 24 yeah they it would almost for sure be a different case but I think um, the moral of the story is if the path or any other shop tells you, oh, like this brand says this is probably going to come on, say, March 15th, like maybe it will. And that's probably their best guess. But like a lot of ETAs are fluid and changing right now. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, um, what does that do to? I think it's due to issues at the port. And, and I think it's due to issues in production. And I also think it's due to issues, just chaos at all levels of distribution from people being out with COVID and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's hard for a lot of the brands to even stay on top of the, what what's coming when, and then it gets there and it's just gone immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, So the other side of the story is, you know, there are bikes we have in the shop today that I've told dozens of people we're not getting again this year that suddenly we did get. Hmm. So it's like casting a net. It's like fishing with a net. You you cast the net, you see what you get. That's the bike shop experience <laughs> right now. So <laughs> yeah, but you guys, I you guys do have a lot of bikes like on the floor. Like I think if yeah? your budget goes into that four or five six thousand dollar range, there's less mm-hmm. pressure on that inventory. Okay, got it. There's still a lot of pressure and still. Like, like if it's a Santa Cruz, for example, good luck, even mm-hmm. on the more, like we have them, but like the odds of us having the actual color model size you want, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe be cool with the color that you don't want. Like maybe but, you want the Oxblood Santa Cruz, but you're going to be cool with the monster with grand the green monster jam green. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh I love that color now. I'm actually glad I got it. Like, I call it Monster Mash. Monster. Oh, that's good. Oh, I've been calling it the watermelon. <laughs> it's 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 literally, in my opinion, Monster Green. Oh, like Monster Movie, like hor- horror movie Green. 
See, I wish I had heard you say that because I would have, I've named it already. I've named it the melon, the hard melon. So uh, I can't, I can't rename it now because I would have called it monster something. It has an identity. (laughs) The identity it has is the identity it has. Yep. That's what it has. Um, Hey man, this has been really cool, but I have a surprise for you. Um, And this thing is called the exit exam. The exit exam is this. The imaginary organization called Mountain Biking um, has a mountain biker license. Um, And in order to get the mountain biker license, you have to take an exam. You, however, are one of the authors of this exam. And you have to write, you have three more questions you have to write that a mountain biker has to get correct in order to get their license. Got it. So please provide these questions and their answers. Okay. So question number one is, um, rank the right of way between horses, hikers, and bike riders on multi-use trails. And the answer basically is that mountain bikers yield to both hikers and horses. Nice. Hikers and equestrians. Um, I would definitely yield to a horse (laughs) with or without a rider. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, Another one, I guess, would be something along the lines of um, how... um, how fast is this, how fast can I ride my bike in, in multi on multi-use trails? And it's like, generally speaking, it's a speed where you wouldn't, where you take responsibility that you would never collide with another user and, or even startle or scare another user hmm. really. And, and, and preferably. Nice. Um, and then the third I'm going to do one that's more for the rider this time and less for the community. And it's um, (laughs) how often should I lube my chain? And it's um, if it makes any noise that sounds like not a lubed chain. (laughs) (laughs) And if you don't know, lube your chain. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. I have to say you, um, you, I think you've had the, 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 the finest performance of the, coming up with the questions. Oh, thanks, Alan. Yeah. Like most people, like they, they don't actually give me a question that I could put on an exam nor the answer. So yeah, that's, that was great. Awesome. Thanks. You freaking nailed it. Tony, thank you so much um, for doing this, for taking the time. I know you're busy. You got a family, your shop owner. Um, love your shop. And it's, it's been good chatting with you. Um, any, any last words for the mountain biking community? Uh, no, man, it's a real pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. I really admire what you're doing and, and the community you're building around your riding. And thanks for representing the path. And I hope we get to ride again soon. And uh, um, love the bike you ride. Heck yeah, love the bike you ride. All right, crew. Hope you dug this. Until the next episode, like this video, subscribe this channel, notify that bell. But most importantly, go have a rad day. This is the Airhorn Podcast. Gonna slow down and talk about going fast. It's another mountain biking podcast. And we sometimes answer questions you have. Listen at one and a quarter speed. You can listen in any order you please. It